Thank you. Uh, my name is John Beer. I'm the CTO of uh, Zapnito. So I'm going to just talk to you um, for hopefully. I was, I was going to aim for Jamie's new target of five minutes, but it's actually a 20 minute talk. So um, we talked to you a bit about how we're basically taking our Rails app, which is a sort of increasingly becoming legacy, and moving that over page by page to Ember. Um, so a lot of this work actually has been done by Aaron Chambers. I think most of you probably will know know who Aaron Chambers is. He was doing the big talk on MCLI Deploy um, at Ambercamp. Um, so he's kind of should take all the credit for this, actually. So I'm just here. I just kind of gave him permission to do it, which was kind of fun. Um, so yeah, hopefully it's good for you guys to sort of see how we're doing this. It's, it's quite a, I think it's quite an innovative, innovative approach. Um, there's probably alternatives, but it should be uh, useful, hopefully. So I'll just quickly go through um, so a bit about Zapnito. We're, we're, we're what we call an expert network platform which might sound a bit crazy, but we're, we basically um, provide networks of experts in, a, in a kind of any, any niche. So these are just a couple of examples. Um, this, this one from Nature is, a, is scientists talking about how to be good, good at scientific writing. Uh, this one in the top here is a biofilms community. So these guys are all talking about microbiomes, which is kind of like gut, back, gut bacteria. Um, so what you're looking at here is kind of the front end of the Rails app. And as, we, as we're gradually sort of putting page by page is moving over to Ember. Um, and I actually just wanted to just sort of double up a little bit on how, how important Aaron was for this. So I was searching around for a photo of Aaron Chambers and these are the guys that came up on, <laughs> on Google. No, it's actually this guy. Um, <laughs> so I think you'll know him, yeah. So he's, he's the kind of the brains behind most of this. Um, and I would also say that I'm fairly new to Ember as well. So at the end when Christians come, be nice. <laughs> um, so what we'll talk about is just want to give a quick refresh of MCLI deploy and, and sort of mainly the lightning pack, which is the approach we're using. I think, I think most of you should be familiar with it. I would be surprised if you're not. Um, but obviously, we're using that in our approach. So I'll quickly go through sort of how, how we're using that. Um, give you a quick demo of our MCLI uh, deployment. Oh, sorry. It's not, it's not appearing on there. Quick demo of our MCLI deployment. Um, and, and how we're using that uh, sort of page by page. Uh, so detail on our sort of Rails, layout, Rail, Rails layouts and templates, so how they've kind of changed a little bit in, in away from the standard Rails conventions. Um, again, moving from the templates onto Rail, uh, Rails controllers and, and a class that we've created, Aaron's created, called Ember, Ember Config Adapter. And now quickly, just at the end, I'll go through some alternatives because there, there are some alternatives to this approach in terms of you know, embedding Ember with, uh, with Rails. So I guess why do, it, why do this? Why not, why not just rewrite the app? It's a question I think was, there was a bit of a heated debate on, on this Ember Slack channels a few weeks ago about how um, the approach for sort of whether you just rewrite your app from, from day one, if you've got a legacy Rails app, why don't you just sort of throw it away and start again on, on a new lovely kind of Ember world. So for us, um, Zapnuto is not like VC backed. Um, we don't have like millions of dollars to, to burn on crazy off like awesome offices and you know, spending 12 months building stuff. So revenue is really driving our product. Um, so we've got good revenue, but not really enough to spend a long time rewriting a, a quite a sophisticated big app. Um, we have customers to keep happy. I know it's a crazy, <laughs> crazy idea, um, but we've got basically we're an we're enterprise, enterprise level sort of SaaS, SaaS provider. So we have you know, at the moment half a dozen customers, and they're really sort of driving product improvement. So we'd never get away with sort of saying 12 months of no, no new features. Uh, it wouldn't wouldn't go down very well. Um, so yeah, we can't. I guess we can't really wait 12, 12 months just to deliver a nicer version of the same same app. Did I, did I labour that point enough for you? <laughs> I think so. Um, yeah, so we kind of have no choice really but to, um, but to do, find an iterative way to do this. Um, and so actually the other thing about this as well, which I think I'd sort of touch on at the end of the slides, is our strategy, technical strategy, is to really be, we are committed to Ember to, for managing our front end. We're not really want to stay in a world where Rails is managing our front end anymore. We really want to drive towards it. So we have made a decision now to actually really split the two and the, app, the Rails app will just be the API eventually. There's no kind of halfway, halfway place for us, so there is commitment to it, which I think Jamie would be happy to hear, I think. Um, 
So just a quick recap on, for those of you guys who are not fully aware, on Ember CLI Deploy. Um, essentially, you have uh, your server, Ember Dev server. So this will, Ember CLI Deploy will push a, effectively a HTML file to Redis. Um, and then your Rails server will pick that up from Redis. You can use non-Redis deployments, but that's a fairly typical one. Uh, so the Rails server will pick up the HTML file, send that down to the browser, and at the same time, when you deploy, MCLI deploy will push the static assets of JS or CSS, so on up to AWS S3. Um, and obviously that's available to, for the browser to pull that down. So it's effectively what Ember CLI Deploy does. And then you might, see, you might be familiar with this diagram that Aaron put up during Ember Camp, which is the deploy pipeline. So effectively what Ember CLI Deploy does is it, um, it's actually going the opposite direction. So from left to right, it goes through a configure, build, prepare, and upload step, um, steps. And then alongside that, there's various plugins that you can use to make that happen. So in our case, we're using build plugins, uh, revision data plugins, which basically give you a fingerprint, uh, S3, Redis, and then gzipping. So that's effectively what MBCLI Deploy does. So just a quick recap, really, to set the scene on that. And so I've got a, just a quick video, it's only like 30 seconds long, hopefully, of, of this kind of, it's actually happening. So just on the console, deploying to staging, uh, this will go through and actually hopefully you can read it, it's a bit small. Um, so it's gone through there, it's gone, it's gone through to deploying to Redis, building manifests, uh, generating all the various static files that you need, gzipping them. Just scroll back up so you can see those, what's it, one by one? It's actually off the screen a bit, but... So through build, uh, gzipping, pushing to S3, pushing the HTML file to Redis, um, and then finishing off. And at the end of this, you'll get a, uh, what we call a revision key, which is a fingerprint of all those assets together, which is actually this number here, 87, I think I'll get it in a minute, 87073, this one here. So this is basically the unique key that we generate, which, which is stored in Redis as a unique key, and then that, that HTML file is stored in Redis as a value. Um, in our case, we actually store JSON. So the, the normal convention for, for H, uh, Ember CLI deploys, you'd store an HTML file. So I've copied that, I've copied that um, revision key. And so just, just to quickly take a step back for a minute, this is one of our, one of our websites, one of our Zapnito networks called Biopharma Dealmakers, which is a, a network of biopharmaceutical companies. Um, so just to go through, this page here actually is a standard Rails page that you're looking at. There's no Ember, no Ember stuff on this page yet, actually. Um, so just clicking through, going to the Companies tab, you see the drop down here at the top. Um, so this, when I click on Network is here, this is going to an Ember page. It's a pretty, there's not a huge amount of stuff on here yet. It's fairly new, it's only a couple of weeks old. But it's basically a list, list of companies. So everything, everything inside this, frame is Ember. Uh, Rails is still generating the, uh, the menu bar there. So what I'm doing, you can see I'm doing this without, type, without hands, which is pretty awesome. Um, putting in the top just a query parameter there, which is uh, enable Ember, and then dropping in, pasting in that revision key, which I copied from a deploy script. And having done that, what I'm doing here is just saying I want to load a different version of the app. So when you first looked at this page, it was loading the, the current version of the Ember app. And so having pasted that enable Ember query parameter in the, in the query string, I'm telling, I'm telling Rails to pick up a different version of the Ember app. Um, so I, I kind of went through it a bit too quickly. It didn't look any different. The, <laughs> the main difference was that they were alphabetically ordered. Um, I, ideally, I would have had a slightly better version of the app to show you. Um, but yes, you might take my word for it unless you want to watch the video again. Um, so the cool thing about that really is that you know, Rails is rendering the header and it's rendering the footer, um, mm. which I think I've got just sort of highlighted somewhere. Um, yeah, next one. So the great thing about it really is we can have multiple versions of, it, of, a, of the Ember app deployed in production. And then we can, do, we can sort of put, put them on there 
and say, you know, give it out to a bunch of beta testers and say, test this for us before we, make it, before we actually activate it. So it's pretty, it's pretty awesome, really. It's very different to the Rails world where we just deploy it to Heroku and it's, the whole app is deployed at once. With this, we can have as many versions of the MVAP deployed as we want, and we just choose a revision key uh, for which one we want. So, um, so that's kind of the, the scene, really, of what we're doing. Um, so this, just really just to reiterate that kind of page by page, that enable Ember URL parameter allows us to run the legacy Rails page alongside um, the sort of beta Ember page in production. So that example doesn't really show it very well, but you could have had on that page like an old version, a Rails version of that company listing, and then you could drop in the enable Ember uh, query param, and it'll just swap out for the Ember version. So you can actually progressively swap out Rails pages and swap them in with, with Ember pages, which is pretty, pretty nice, actually. Um, so to do that, basically we've got a method on the, on the Rails application controller called render, render Ember if requested. So that's checking if that query param is there. And if it is there, it will render Ember. Um, and then we've also got another method on the Rails application controller. Oops, there's one behind something called render ember. So that will always, if we call render ember, that will always render the render, always render the ember app. Uh, obviously, whereas this one will do it if you request it. So just to quickly go through kind of a request cycle, sort of high level, we've got standard Rails routes, standard Rails controllers. We've got a method, what we do basically, we, call, we come into the Rails controller in that Rails controller, we call render ember um, from the application controller. That we then load the style and script resources from, from Redis that we previously pushed up there. Uh, that we then assign what we call an ember config instance variable uh, in the controller. So it's a standard Rails instance variable. Um, and then we basically render a, a dedicated Ember index template, which actually has not, not much in it at all apart from just a div tag, which the Ember app boots from. Um, and then basically inside that config, you've got the JS files and the CS files that you need to render the Ember app. And that's just this custom. We've basically, inside that Ember index template, there's one div which says Ember app container, and the Ember app knows to boot from that rather than the body tag. So um, just to talk through quickly kind of how our Rails layouts have changed from standard Rails conventions, we've got our, our, our application HTML ERB template basically has hardly anything in it anymore. It's just got one line which delegates down to what we call lay layouts base. So in that base template, you've actually got down there, if you can see it, the standard the standard stuff that you'd normally see in the application template, you know, the, the HTML tag, the body um, and the head. We're rendering a layout from a partial. So rend rendering, rendering a head, a head from the p from, a, from a partial nav and footer. So all that stuff you normally get in this file has been moved down. Um, and then we've got a new file called Ember Application HTML. And this has got a whole bunch of new stuff in, which is specific for this approach, where using content for tags. So if that exists, if there's content in content for, for Ember link on the Ember link uh, key, then we'll take that Ember config instance variable that I talked about before, and that, that, that will contain, um, hopefully will contain link tags for style sheets, and then again for scripts. So we'll call that if we have that Ember, render Ember uh, uh, method on the application controller called. And then this will call down to base afterwards. <coughs> and then there's another file which is the head partial. So this will, the head partial will look for um, the Ember link and Ember script content if it exists. So that's kind of like how the, how the templates have been split up and they work kind of in parallel. Uh, so just quickly on the controllers, that example where I showed the directories of companies, um, that's basically what it looks like. There's hardly anything in it really. Um, so there's an action on there called organizations, and on the, in this case we're just calling render ember, so it knows just to delegate straight back to, back to ember. And then also we can call render ember if requested, so that will check through if that query param exists. So it's quite, that's pretty straightforward really. 
Um, and then application controller, this is where most of the work on the rail side is happening. Uh, that's the render, what the render ember method looks like. So that's assigning, the first thing it's doing is assigning that ember uh, config instance variable. And that is basically calling through, that's where it takes the, uh, the query string parameter as the version identifier. And that adapter I'll talk, talk about in a minute, because that, that adapter is basically what's calling through from, to, get, to get the data from Redis. And the last thing it does is obviously render that Ember template. Uh, template. That's just a pretty much simple helper method to get the query string parameter. Uh, the key thing here with this is that if that enable Ember query, pr query param doesn't exist on the URL, then it will return the current word, which basically is a, we're, we're telling Redis to return this, what's, what's been assigned as the current version. It's pretty, stand, pretty simple, really. Um, and then the adapter. This method basically is checking the environment. We have an environment variable. Um, so in Rails configuration, in production, you can tell it to use Redis. Or if it's development, you can tell it to return a local version. So that's all we talked about this, really. This is what, the, this is what that uh, Ember index template looks like. There's not just one tag in it. There's nothing in there, really. And this is, the, this is the really the structure of the JSON uh, content that we push into Redis. So in there you've got, I mean, the most important stuff is the link array and the script array containing the fingerprinted CSS for our Ember app, and then obviously the fingerprinted uh, JS for the Ember app. And then there's also some meta, meta information there which tells, tells Ember to root off the Ember app container. That's pretty much what's just stored in Redis, basically. So then just to recap, basically, where that JSON object is used is obviously to use when we, when we render this stuff here. This is effectively what the Ember config adapter looks like. So in terms of the Rails, Rails environment configuration, in production, we use a Redis version. In development, we basically have a a hard-coded version which says call through to a locally running Ember server. So when you're working in development, you've got a Rails server running and you've got an Ember server running and it knows to connect. This is essentially what the Ember config adapter code looks like. So there's a Redis client, um, which is really simple down here, just using the Redis gem in Rails to pull that value back. And this is essentially using that key to pull it out of Redis. There's not, not anything ma amazing in there. It's just passing, getting that JSON back and returning it back as a, as a Ruby hash. But it's pretty, I know it's pretty standard, but it's kind of, it's kind of awesome as well, all at the same time. Um, so just to recap that, that step, really. So we've got standard routes, which is that directory organizations controller. Um, we call render ember from application controller. Uh, that Ember version identifier from the query param tells us what version of the Ember app we want to use. Uh, we use the Ember config adapter to get, to get all that JSON from Redis. We've got that Ember, oops, sorry, assign the, assign the, co the uh, instance variable. And then we, use, we obviously call through to that, that, that virtually empty template to, to root off the Ember app. So that's, that's basically the, the steps that we've gone through. So just quickly to talk about some alternatives, because um, there are other ways of doing this. So the benefits of our approach for us, really, are um, M the Ember CLI app is really sort of loosely coupled from the Rails app. Um, it's, it's a standalone Ember CLI app. It doesn't really know anything about Rails. It's not embedded in Rails. So the development workflow for that is you know, nice and fast and quick and really awesome. Um, we can deploy the Ember CLI app in independently of the Rails app. So at the moment, from Circle CI, we probably deploy the Ember CLI app on a, you know, four or five times a day. The Rails app's getting deployed maybe once a day. But they're totally independent of one another. Um, oops. Yeah, so develop, developer workflow is, oops, skip through it. Developer workflow is separated. It's not fully separated yet, but it is getting there between the two apps. 
Um, again, we're able to swap out the old Rails render page, page by page. Uh, as I said, so we can do this in, we can beta test the Ember app in production. And again, as I said, we're kind of, we're fully committed to Ember. Um, so the thing about Ember Islands, and, and em, which uses Ember CLI Rails, is it's still sort of inside the Rails world. Um, I haven't really gone into detail yet of Ember Islands. When we first started this approach, Ember, which was about nine months ago, um, Ember Islands was still quite immature, I think, at that time, or l less mature than it is now, certainly. Um, and the other thing about this as well is with Ember CLI Rails, you sort of have to wait for those guys to up. When Ember CLI gets updated, you have to wait for those guys to get up to date. So as we're fully separated, we can just be as fast as Ember CLI is as well, which is great. Uh, so some just quick drawbacks and drawbacks from that we're kind of aware of. Um, the main one, which is giving us a bit of pain at the moment, is Rails is still all the SAS variables are still, are still in Rails and we haven't figured out a way of sharing the SAS variables. So you might want to do some coding on the, on the Ember app and you can get access to the SAS variables, but you, you, don't know where, where, you don't know anything about them at the moment. All you have is a compiled CSS style sheet. So we want to try and figure out a way of sharing them. Um, yeah, and in development, you have to have Rails running locally to get, to get a style sheet and to get the header and the footer. So you do have to have Rails set up on your, on your devs, on your laptop. I mean, it's not, not the end of the world, but it's a bit of a pain. Um, so yeah, other stuff really, just kind of, it's our first attempt, like it's working really well, but I think there's, if anybody's got any thoughts or ideas on how to improve it, particularly around the CSS problem would be, or SAS problem would be, would be appreciated. So uh, that's it. So any questions, uh, welcome. Oh, actually, what I should say, if you've got any questions, save them for Aaron. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, just on the, on the SAS thing, the obvious thing is you leave it to the Ember app. You're, you don't need to be compiling this stuff with your Rails app in the runtime. You can just presume that you've got the same way that you've got your index HTML. Yeah. Well, I think we, <coughs> we probably, I think we were, we did start to go down that route recently. Um, and it kind of wasn't working, so we kind of moved it back again. <laughs> it was kind of a bit of panic. <laughs> um, but I think we, yeah, that's what we do want to do, is try to move it into Ember, really, because that's where it should be. Um, so it's just kind of getting to that, that step. So this is an Ember question, so you defer it completely. Yeah, or well, Mario might be able to answer, oh, it, actually. <laughs> well, why don't you try me, and I'll give it a go. So the, the unusual thing here is you're, it sounds to me like you're serving up one single Ember application, yeah. but only in cert on certain pages. At the moment, yeah. Which means then that your navigation, where you are in the Ember application, is not determined by what comes after a hashtag. Yeah. But what comes just just your actual URL that you've requested. Basically. So you yeah. presumably have to write something to sort of pull out your actual location and then put you into the right bit of the router. Uh, yeah. So we infer this fade from the URL. Right. Both from the in the rel side, both in the Ember CLI application. So basically, when you're visiting dash organization dash whatever. And we're rendering the Ember CLI app, it's a workflow. Right. Do you have a roadmap to convert to the client side navigation? I'm sorry? Do you have a roadmap to convert to the client side navigation? What do you mean by a roadmap? Like, what? So when, whenever we're like a flow that we're migrating a page, right? It's, say that a page is present on, I don't know, dash foo, right? And we say now we need to emberify this. Uh -huh. So on the Ember CLI app, when we serve it, we generate a, a route called dash foo. I mean, aware of that. I mean, for example, you have two URLs, like dash organizations and like dash experts, right? And uh, apparently, you navigate between them by uh, rendering the new page every time. Oh, you say, how do we treat links that are in Ember but uh, depend on a Rails page? No, I mean, for example, when you have both, both these pages and you have to Ember, yeah, what's the one to make it by a navigation? Uh, so yes, for now uh, we're basically re-rendering the entire thing. So say that um, yeah. you know the organizations page and the Ember app is rendering one container, so there's another page that also that has also been Emberified. So we basically just link to that, and the Rails app just serves the entire thing again, and the app just boots. Yeah, no, but uh, do you have any plans to migrate to client side navigation? Uh, yeah. It's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, uh, it will happen yeah, eventually. Yeah. yeah. I think, I mean, it, it will happen. At the moment, we've got, there's two main pages within the site which have got this. There's that company directory and there's another page, which is sort of an admin page. 
Um, but sooner or later, the, the wait, you know, the, wait, the, the waiting between the two apps will, will mean that the, it's much more important to have the navigation and, and linking all in Ember. So at some point or another, we're going to have to flip it over. It's not, it's not an easy question because Fiverr have like 10% of Ember, for example, 90% of uh, Rails, right? And mm -hmm. is it usual when you have a, like a 90% Ember, 10% Rails? Yeah. You, you'll have to do something like do it maybe the opposite way, like render it all. Yeah, I suspect once we get to that point, we'll we'll bite the bullet and do the do the rewrite. So it's kind of buying us time. <laughs> I think that's going to happen at some point. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's I think that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you so much, John.